Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the September 2021 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of Dead Chauvinism and Living Socialism, How the International Can Be Restored by Lenin from 1914. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting us on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So before we get started, my apologies for the air conditioner noise in the background. It's summer, I'm on an upper floor, and it's hot. I try to turn it off whenever I can to do these recordings, but can only do so much. Okay, so this was originally published in Social Democrat number 35 from December 12, 1914, and it's published here according to that text. The source is Lenin, Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1974, Moscow, Volume 21. Thanks, as usual, to the Marxists Internet Archive at marxists.org for hosting this file and thousands of other free Marxist texts. Please check them out and support them if you can. So, let's get into the text. For decades, German social democracy was a model to the social democrats of Russia, even somewhat more than to the social democrats of the whole world. It is therefore clear that there can be no intelligent, i.e. critical, attitude towards the now prevalent social patriotism, or socialist, chauvinism, without a more precise definition of one's attitude towards German social democracy. What was it in the past? What is it today? What will it be in the future? A reply to the first of these questions may be found in Der Weg zur Macht, a pamphlet written by Karl Kautsky in 1909 and translated into many European languages. Containing a most complete exposition of the tasks of our times, it was most advantageous to the German social democrats in the sense of the promise they held out, and moreover came from the pen of the most eminent writer of the Second International. We shall recall the pamphlet in some detail. This will be the more useful now, since those forgotten ideals are often so barefacedly cast aside. Social democracy is a revolutionary party, as stated in the opening sentence of the pamphlet, not only in the sense that a steam engine is revolutionary, but also in another sense. Quick comment here. When they talk about social democracy in these terms prior to the Russian Revolution of 1917, they're talking about the entire movement that included communists and what we would think of as social democrats and radlibs today. It was prior to those splits, and it's not what we would call social democracy today in the sense of reformed capitalism, just to be clear. Continuing, it wants conquest of political power by the proletariat, the dictatorship of the proletariat. Heaping ridicule on doubters of the revolution, Kautsky writes, quote, In any important movement and uprising, we must, of course, reckon with the possibility of defeat. Prior to the struggle, only a fool can consider himself quite certain of victory, unquote. However, to refuse to consider the possibility of victory would be a direct betrayal of our cause. A revolution in connection with a war, he says, is possible both during and after a war. It is impossible to determine at which particular moment the sharpening of class antagonisms will lead to revolution, but, the author continues, quote, I can quite definitely assert that a revolution that war brings in its wake will break out either during or immediately after the war, unquote. Nothing is more vulgar, we read further, than the theory of, quote, the peaceful growing into socialism. Quote, nothing is more erroneous, he continues, quote, than the opinion that a cognition of economic necessity means a weakening of the will. The will, as a desire for struggle, he says, quote, is determined first by the price of the struggle, secondly by a sense of power, and thirdly by actual power, unquote. When an attempt was made, incidentally by Forverts, another magazine, to interpret Engels' famous preface to the class struggles in France in the meaning of opportunism, Engels became indignant, and called shameful any assumption that he was, quote, a peaceful worshiper of legality at any price. Quote, we have every reason to believe, Kautsky goes on to say, that we are entering upon a period of struggle for state power, unquote. That struggle may last for decades. That is something we do not know, but, quote, it will in all probability bring about, in the near future, a considerable strengthening of the proletariat, if not its dictatorship, in Western Europe, unquote. Quick note there from the text on Engels' reaction to Forverts. It says, 
In its issue of March 30, 1895, Favart's published a summary and several extracts from Engels' preface to Marx's The Class Struggles in France, 1848 to 1850, omitting very important propositions on the revolutionary role of the proletariat. This evoked a vehement protest from Engels. In his letter to Kautsky of April 1st, 1895, Engels wrote, quote, To my astonishment, I see in the Forverts today an extract from my introduction, printed without my prior knowledge, and trimmed in such a fashion that I appear as a peaceful worshiper of legality at any price, unquote. Engels insisted on the introduction being published in full. In 1895, it was published in the journal Die Neue Zeit, but with considerable deletions, these at the insistence of the German Social Democratic Party leadership. Seeking to justify their reformist tactics, the leaders of German social democracy subsequently began to interpret their version of the introduction as Engels' renunciation of revolution, armed uprisings, and barricade fighting. The original text of the introduction was first published in the Soviet Union in 1955. See Marx and Engels' Selected Works, Volume 1. Okay, back to the main text. The revolutionary elements are growing, Kautsky declares. Out of 10 million voters in Germany in 1895, there were 6 million proletarians and 3.5 million people interested in private property. In 1907, the latter grew by 0.03 million, but the former by 1.6 million. Quote, the rate of the advance becomes very rapid as soon as a time of revolutionary ferment comes, unquote. I'm going to read that again. The rate of the advance becomes very rapid as soon as a time of revolutionary ferment comes. Things can happen fast. Class antagonisms are not blunted, but on the contrary, grow acute. Prices rise, and imperialist rivalry and militarism are rampant. Quote, a new era of revolution is drawing near. The monstrous growth of taxes would, quote, long ago have led to war as the only alternative to revolution had not that very alternative of revolution stood closer after a war than after a period of armed peace. Quote, a world war is ominously imminent, Kautsky continues, quote, and war means also revolution, Unquote. In 1891, Engels had reason to fear a premature revolution in Germany. Since then, however, quote, the situation has greatly changed. The proletariat, quote, can no longer speak of a premature revolution, quoting Kautsky. The petty bourgeoisie is downright unreliable and is ever more hostile to the proletariat, but in a time of crisis it is, quote, capable of coming over to our side in masses, unquote. The main thing is that social democracy, quote, should remain unshakable, consistent, and irreconcilable, unquote. We have undoubtedly entered a revolutionary period. That is how Kautsky wrote in times long, long past, fully five years ago. This is what German social democracy was, or more correctly, what it promised to be. This was the kind of social democracy that could and had to be respected. Quick comment there from me. So let's reread that because we are having this debate in the Marxist world right now in the United States. The petty bourgeoisie is downright unreliable and is ever more hostile to the proletariat. Those are Lenin's words. But in a time of crisis, quoting Kautsky, it is capable of coming over to our side. However, Lenin says again, the main thing is that social democracy, i.e. actual socialists, quote, should remain unshakable, consistent, and irreconcilable. So what does that mean? It means that the petty bourgeoisie is unreliable and often hostile to the proletariat. These would be the right populists that people seem so fascinated, white socialists and white populists seem so fascinated with courting. However, while it is technically possible for them to come over and side with the proletariat in a revolutionary time. You got to read the room, first of all, and see where they're actually at. And throughout it all, we've got to stick to our guns. In other words, remain unshakable, consistent, and irreconcilable in our social democratic 
capital letters meaning Marxist, communist views. We need to remain unshakable, consistent, and irreconcilable. In other words, in courting the unreliable and potentially very hostile petty bourgeoisie, we need to stick to our guns and not water it down. You don't meet them halfway. You teach them Marxism or you don't get involved because they're unreliable and hostile unless they come over to our side, not going over to theirs. I don't see a lot of that happening, them coming over to our side. I know because I have read thousands of social media interactions. I mean, not all of them are real people, okay? It's social media. Some of them are, I'm sure, bots. But the point is that Look at the overall trend. Be honest with yourself. Where is it really heading? I see more people forging an alliance with people who they haven't changed any minds with, signing up for what I think is undoubtedly going to wind up being a fascist movement. In the United States, political energy moves so easily to the right. It moves so easily to the right. This is horseshoe theory, okay? When you go so far to the left, capitalists have definitely built on-ramps that go back into the right wing because they're all about trying to capture that energy. In reality, you can keep going left and break out of the whole thing and wind up a Marxist. But you've got to go so against the grain to end up in this place. It's so easy to get sucked back into that. And that's what happens. You wind up getting played. So the main thing, quoting Lenin, is that social democracy should remain unshakable, consistent, and irreconcilable. And if the petty bourgeoisie doesn't like it, fuck them. They could be an asset if they came over. But the bottom line is that the proletariat is huge now. It's huge. So we have more than enough potential allies to recruit from the proletariat without reaching into the petty bourgeoisie if they don't want to come over. And if they don't, no amount of wishful thinking is going to make them less of our enemy. You know, you either change their mind or they're a liability. All right. Continuing with this excellent text so far. See what the self-same Kautsky writes today. Here are the most important statements in his article, Social Democracy in Wartime from Die Neue Zeit, number one, 1914. Quote, Our party has far more rarely discussed the question of how to behave in wartime than how to prevent war. Never is government so strong, never are parties so weak as at the outbreak of war. Wartime is least of all favorable to peaceful discussion. Today, the practical question is victory or defeat for one's country. Unquote. Wow. So that's what he boiled it down to. Victory or defeat for quote, your own country. Can there be an understanding, this is back to Lenin, among the parties of the belligerent countries regarding anti-war action? Quoting Kautsky, that kind of thing has never been tested in practice. We have always disputed that possibility, unquote. So the difference between the French and German socialists is, quote, not one of principle, as both defend their fatherlands. Quote, Social Democrats of all countries have an equal right or an equal obligation to take part in the defense of the fatherland. No nation should blame the other for doing so. Quoting again, has the international turned bankrupt? These are now Mehring's questions. Has the international turned bankrupt? Has the party rejected direct defense of its party principles in wartime? Quoting Kautsky, that is an erroneous conception. There are no grounds at all for such pessimism. The differences are not fundamental. Unity of principles remains. To disobey wartime laws would simply lead to suppression of our press. Wow. Unquote. Obedience to these laws, quote, implies rejection of defensive party principles just as little as similar behavior of our party press under that sword of Damocles, the anti-socialist law, unquote. That's quite, uh, quite a don't-rock-the-boat type of ideology there. Back to Lenin. We have purposely quoted from the original because it is hard to believe that such things could have been written. It is hard to find in literature, except in that coming from downright renegades, such smug vulgarity, such shameful departure from the truth, 
such unsavory subterfuge to cover up the most patent renunciation, both of socialism in general and of precise international decisions unanimously adopted, as, for instance, in Stuttgart and particularly in Basel, precisely in view of the possibility of a European war just like the present one. It would be disrespectful toward the reader were we to read Kautsky's arguments in earnest and to try to analyze them, if the European war differs in many respects from a simple, little, quote-unquote, anti-Jewish pogrom, the, quote, socialist arguments in favor of participation in such a war fully resemble the, quote, democratic arguments in favor of participation in an anti-Jewish pogrom. One does not analyze arguments in favor of a pogrom. One only points them out so as to put their authors to shame in the sight of all class-conscious workers. But how could it have come to pass, the reader will ask, that the leading authority in the Second International, a writer who once defended the views quoted at the beginning of this article, has sunk to something that is worse than being a renegade. That will not be understood, we answer, only by those who, perhaps unconsciously, consider that nothing out of the ordinary has happened, and that it is not difficult to forgive and forget, etc., i.e. by those who regard the matter from the renegade's point of view. Those, however, who have earnestly and sincerely professed socialist convictions and have held the views set forth in the beginning of this article will not be surprised to learn that Forverts is dead, Martov's expression at the Paris Gobs, and that Kautsky is, quote, dead. The political bankruptcy of individuals is not a rarity at turning points in history. Despite the tremendous services he has rendered, Kautsky has never been among those who, at great crises, immediately take a militant Marxist stand, recall his vacillations on the issue of Mielerandism. And there's a note there from the text footnote on Mielerandism. It was an opportunist trend named after the French, quote, socialist, Mielerand, who in 1899 joined the reactionary bourgeois government of France and helped the bourgeoisie in conducting its policy. The admissibility of socialists' participation in bourgeois governments was discussed at the Paris Congress of the Second International in 1900. The Congress adopted Kautsky's conciliatory resolution condemning socialists' participation in bourgeois governments, but permitting it in certain, quote, exceptional cases. The French socialists used this proviso to justify their joining the bourgeois government at the beginning of the First World War. Now back to the main text. It is such times that we are passing through now. You shoot first, Monsieur the Bourgeoisie. Engels wrote that in 1891, advocating most correctly the use of bourgeois legality by us, revolutionaries, in the period of so-called peaceful constitutional development. Engels' idea was crystal clear. We class-conscious workers, he said, will be the next to shoot. It is to our advantage to exchange ballots for bullets, to go over to civil war, at the moment the bourgeoisie itself has broken the legal foundation it has laid down. In 1909, Kautsky voiced the undisputed opinion held by all revolutionary social democrats when he said that revolution in Europe cannot now be premature and that war means revolution. If you want the original quote where Engels said that, it is from Socialism in Germany, section 1. Peaceful, quote-unquote, decades, however, have not passed without leaving their mark. They have of necessity given rise to opportunism in all countries and made it prevalent among parliamentarian, trade union, journalistic, and other, quote, leaders. There is no country in Europe where, in one form or another, a long and stubborn struggle has not been conducted against opportunism, the latter being supported in a host of ways by the entire bourgeoisie, which is striving to corrupt and weaken the revolutionary proletariat. Fifteen years ago, at the outset of the Bernstein controversy, the self-same Kautsky wrote that should opportunism turn from a sentiment into a trend, a split would be imminent. In Russia, the old Iskra, which created the Social Democratic Party of the Working Class, declared in an article which appeared in its second issue early in 1901, under the title of On the Threshold of the 20th Century, that the revolutionary class of the 20th century like the revolutionary class of the 18th century, the bourgeoisie, had its own Gironde and its own mountain. There are a couple of footnotes there. Firstly, on Iskra, the spark, 
This was the first all-Russian illegal Marxist newspaper, founded by Lenin in 1900. It played a decisive part in the establishment of the Revolutionary Marxist Party of the working class. The first issue appeared in Leipzig in December 1900. It was subsequently published in Munich, in London, from July 1902, and in Geneva from the spring of 1903. On Lenin's initiative, and with his direct participation, the Iskra editorial board drew up the party program, which was published in Iskra No. 21, and prepared the Second Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, or RSDLP, which marked the beginning of a revolutionary Marxist party in Russia. Soon after the Congress, the Mensheviks, or what we would now consider Social Democrats, helped by Plekhanov, gained control of Iskra, so that, beginning with issue number 52, Iskra ceased being an organ of revolutionary Marxism. On the Mountain, or Montagne, and the Gironde, these were the two political groups of the bourgeoisie during the French bourgeois revolution of 1789. The Montagnards, or the Jacobins, was the name given to the more resolute representatives of the bourgeoisie, the revolutionary class at the time, who stood for the abolition of absolutism and the feudal system. Unlike the Jacobins, the Girondists vacillated between revolution and counter-revolution, and they sought agreement with the monarchy. Lenin called the opportunist trend in social democracy the socialist Gironde, and the revolutionary social democrats the proletarian Jacobins, or the Mountain. After the RSDLP split into Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, Lenin frequently stressed that the Mensheviks represented the Girondist trend in the working class movement. I would just add here that if you're interested in hearing more from Lenin's writings in the early Iskra, we have some of those here on the channel. Just look for Lenin writings from like 1900, 1901, 1902. Back to the main text. The European war is a tremendous historical crisis, the beginning of a new epoch. Like any crisis, the war has aggravated deep-seated antagonisms and brought them to the surface, tearing asunder all veils of hypocrisy, rejecting all conventions, and deflating all corrupt or rotting authorities. This, incidentally, is the salutary and progressive effect of all crises, which only the dull-witted adherents of, quote, peaceful evolution fail to realize. The Second International, which in its 25 or 45 years of existence, according to whether the reckoning is from 1870 or 1889, was able to perform the highly important and useful work of expanding the influence of socialism, and giving the socialist forces preparatory, initial, and elementary organization, has played its historical role and has passed away, overcome not so much by the von Kjux as by opportunism. Let the dead bury their dead. Let the empty-headed busybodies, if not the intriguing lackeys of the chauvinists and the opportunists, labor at the task of bringing together Vanderveld and Sembat with Kautsky and Haas, as though we had another Ivan Ivanovich who has called Ivan Nikiforovich a gander, and has to be urged by his friends to make it up with his enemy. An international does not mean sitting at the same table and having hypocritical and pedophoguing resolutions written by people who think that genuine internationalism consists in German socialists justifying the German bourgeoisie's call to shoot down French workers, and in French socialists justifying the French bourgeoisie's call to shoot down German workers in the name of the defense of the fatherland. The international consists in the coming together, first ideologically, then in due time organizationally as well, of people who, in these grave days, are capable of defending socialist internationalism indeed, i.e. of mustering their forces and, quote, being the next to shoot at the governments and the ruling classes of their own respective fatherlands. This is no easy task. It calls for much preparation and great sacrifices and will be accompanied by reverses and setbacks. However, for the very reason that it is no easy task, it must be accomplished only together with those who wish to perform it and are not afraid of a complete break with the chauvinists and with the defenders of social chauvinism. Such people as Panikuk are doing more than anyone else for the sincere, not hypocritical restoration of a socialist not a chauvinist international. In an article entitled The Collapse of the International, Panikok said, if the leaders get together in an attempt to patch up their differences, that will be of no significance at all. Let us frankly state the facts. 
In any case, the war will compel us to do so, if not tomorrow, then the day after. Three currents exist in international socialism. One, the chauvinists, who are consistently pursuing a policy of opportunism. Two, the consistent opponents of opportunism, who in all countries have already begun to make themselves heard. The opportunists have routed most of them, but defeated armies learn fast and are capable of conducting revolutionary work directed towards civil war. Three, confused and vacillating people who at present are following in the wake of the opportunists and are causing the proletariat most harm by their hypocritical attempts to justify opportunism, something that they do almost scientifically and using the Marxist method. Some of those who are engulfed in the latter current can be saved and restored to socialism, but only through a policy of a most decisive break and split with the former current, with all those who are capable of justifying the war credits vote, the, quote, defense of the fatherland, quote, submission to wartime laws, a willingness to be satisfied with legal means only, and the rejection of civil war. Only those who pursue a policy like this are really building up a socialist international. For our part, we, who have established links with the Russian Collegium of the Central Committee and with the leading elements of the working class movement in St. Petersburg, have exchanged opinions with them and have become convinced that we are agreed on the main points, are in a position, as editors of the central organ, to declare in the name of our party that only work conducted in this direction is party work and social democratic work. The idea of a split in the German social democratic movement may seem alarming to many in its unusualness. The objective situation, however, goes to show that either the unusual will come to pass. After all, Adler and Kautsky did declare at the last session of the Socialist International Bureau, which is the executive body of the Second International, in July 1914, that they did not believe in miracles and therefore did not believe in a European war. Or, we shall witness the painful decomposition of what was once German social democracy. In conclusion, we would like to remind those who are too prone to trust the former German social democrats that people who have been our opponents on a number of issues have arrived at the idea of such a split. Thus Martov has written in Gobbs, quote, Vorwärts is dead. A social democracy which publicly renounces the class struggle would do better to recognize the facts as they are, temporarily disband its organization, and close down its organs, unquote. Thus Plekhanov is quoted by Gobbs as having said in a report, quote, I am very much against splits, but if principles are sacrificed for the integrity of the organization, then better a split than false unity, unquote. Plekhanov was referring to the German radicals. He sees a moat in the eye of the Germans, but not the beam in his own eye. This is an individual feature in him. Over the past 10 years, we have all grown quite used to Plekhanov's radicalism in theory and opportunism in practice. However, if even persons with such oddities begin to talk of a split among the Germans, it is a sign of the times. That is the end of the audiobook. So, thank you, Lenin. Uh, we can see how this debate and discussion was raging, how it was of critical importance to the Second International at the time, and, of course, the Russian Revolution did grow out of World War I. Uh, you know, all of these world wars represent weaknesses. You know, any major military conflict, it represents a crisis and a weakening, if temporary, of the nations involved. And they're spending themselves out trying to resolve the crisis militarily. It's an excellent time for socialists to take advantage and to try to bring it down and then start building socialism in its wake. So I'll leave you with that for now. More text to come very soon. Thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons for all of their support, both just the encouragement of signing up as a patron and also the material support that they're providing. Very much appreciated. If you'd like to get your name on the screen along there with them, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. If not, and you'd like to support liking, sharing, commenting, and subscribing, also click the notifications bell, is a great way to boost the channel and help more people to see this content. Whatever it is you do online and in your community to confront capital and to expand the conversation about building socialism, 
Thank you for doing it. And we'll catch you in the next video.